I'll be the mic guy. Hi, mic guy. Call me the mic guy. We are at a secret, undisclosed location. We call this Goonies Beach. <laughs> fans of the show, fans of the movie will recognize this perspective. We're at Ecola State Park, and uh, we're at one of our favorite places on this planet, where we're deep in contemplation. It's been 20 years since we set off cruising. Can you believe it? Ah, my shoulders and my knees can believe it. It's a time for reflection for us because we're we're considering, we're on the precipice, we're on the edge of going all in on boat number five. This will be a huge leap for us. That's right, we've got tickets booked coming up here in a few days and we're headed back to one of our old stomping grounds that holds a lot of meaning for us. Yeah, this is where, well, I don't want to say the dream started. That was really in San Francisco, but this is where we were ready to launch and head to the South Pacific. It's been 20 years since we started and that got us thinking this is a good time for reflection on all the things that we've learned. So let's boil it down to a top 10, top 20, top, let's see how far we get, shall we? That's right, we got about 35. Let's see how, <laughs> <laughs> let's see which ones are the best. We've gone back and forth with this one. Uh, I mean, even this season, having a home base and a big cruising boat and you know, as great as it sounds or looks on paper, I don't know how realistic it is to maintain a big full-time residence and a big boat. We've tried it both ways. We've had the house and the boat. We've had the house and the RV. And the problem is the house is so comfortable that it just draws you back in and says, oh, come in here. You don't have to worry about the storm. <laughs> I'd say that the biggest problem is just keeping both up. Managing both at the same time is very, very difficult for us. It really feels like simplifying and going all in with one or the other is the smart move. Yeah, it just allows us to really focus on what we've got in front of us and not be worrying about, uh-oh, did the renter do something wrong? Do we have to manage a flood? And the more you own, the more that owns you. More money, more problems. And I think it's true. The simpler you can do this, the better. Pets on board. Oh, do we have experience with this one? We've had two cats on our boat low pressure and we've had sugar. As much as we love having our furry children with us. Our furry children. This is our only pet now. It's called a dead cat. <laughs> but we miss having our furry friends on board. But we realized it's just too hard for us. Boat life is difficult, traveling to different countries, managing the boat, managing the weather, all the unknowns that go into this lifestyle. Adding a furry friend, a pet to the equation makes things just all that much more difficult. I guarantee you it will be the thing that takes us off the boat because <laughs> we'll come to a point where we're like, we got to have a dog. Sorry. Sorry, boat. <laughs> it's dog or boat. Dog or boat. <laughs> If we don't find a boat soon, we're getting a dog. And then you'll know it's lights out for the O'Kellys. Weight does matter. I'm sorry to tell you. What are you saying? That's, I'm working on it. I... No, no, you can't bring all those tools, okay? We heard it a million times before we bought our catamaran, but weight really does matter. And it does not take a whole heck of a lot. Even just filling up the water tanks brings the holes down into the water. And it doesn't just slow you down. It increases the loads on everything, on the sails, on the rigging. Yeah, on Clarity, we wouldn't even keep the water tanks fully loaded. We would have about half tank at all time. When it comes to provisioning, you do want to limit it to what you actually need. I'll never forget going down to low pressure, our first big cruising boat after I think year two and finding vegetables in cans that we had purchased years earlier. I've been hauling around all that weight for absolutely no reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, weight really does matter and you don't need to be stocked to the gills with provisions every time you leave the dock. Yeah, a provisioning tip I like to tell people is just take your time for one week on land and document every single thing you eat. If you're like most people, you eat the same things and that way you can accurately forecast two months, three months of cruising. The main sail really is a pain sail. The main is a pain. 
Frequently, it's the largest or one of the largest sails on the boat, and it can be one of the hardest to handle. So on this next boat, we're really gonna be concentrating on ease of sail handling. You get to a larger boat and these sails, the loads get really big. So how those are controlled is gonna be really important on this next boat. We were wowed by the fabulous paint job on our first big cruising boat. Paint is cheap, engines are not. So when we evaluate these next candidates, we're looking at the quality and condition of the engines. Engines, rig, and sails. Those are the expensive things to consider. Kind of goes without saying that the boat otherwise needs to be structurally sound. I'm very spoiled to have a meteorologist on board, but it really is all about the weather. It's that simple. Before you take off, there's a lot of consideration given to, well, the boat, of course, and the gear on board. I need this size solar panel. I need this size water maker. I need this particular boat because the, I don't know, the couch is at the right position compared to the galley. Really, the, the biggest determining factor between whether it's a fun, successful cruise or trip, or whether it's really, really unpleasant and unenjoyable has got to be the weather. The weather, the weather, the weather. Part of that goes into knowing how to read weather charts and being able to digest a forecast easily. The other part has to do with schedule or lack of schedule. It really goes without saying, you've heard it before, never have a schedule. And the reason is because the weather, you can't predict what it's gonna be like three months out when you're planning that family to come out and see you. So if you are gonna have a schedule, be sure to give yourself at least a week buffer. A week or, or two or even three. Oh, spare me, just spare me. Spare you? Spare you like what, like a toilet rebuild kit? Yeah, or some electrical connectors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've come to realize over these years that you can't keep every spare on board. Uh, you're gonna have things that break that you never would anticipate. Thankfully, DHL, international shipping, it's actually pretty fast. I know there have been some supply chain delays here and there, but for the most part, if you've got a ubiquitously used engine or water maker, you're gonna be able to get those parts sent to you within a matter of days or weeks. You can have more of the little things. Tape, uh, other adhesives, glues, caulks, little wire connectors. Fishing swivels? Who would've thought you'd run out of fishing swivels? All boats are small on the ocean. I don't care if you're a tanker. Google some <laughs> tanker storms. Right, once you're out there in the big blue, the more water line you've got, the more the boat is gonna handle those waves. Of course, there's lots of design considerations that go into this, but overall, bigger boats are more comfortable. There is a huge downside though. You gotta find a bigger haul out facility. You gotta pay more for berthing. All the loads are much heavier. You might need an electric winch. And everything basically is much, much more expensive. It's not, this thing is twice the size of the other thing and therefore it's twice as much money. It's more like this thing is twice the size of this other thing and it's four times as much money. I think a lot of people never get off the couch because of fear. And really we've come to learn that fear is your friend. You should be afraid. The ocean is a hostile environment. Anybody that tries to make it look like it's just a cakewalk paddle across a lake has never been on the ocean because there's a lot of things that can go wrong with dire consequences. But knowing that, understanding that, seeing how ferocious the ocean can actually be, well, that actually helps to inform you and prepare you. So that fear leads to preparation, which allows you to relax just a bit more. Yep, you're only gonna make that mistake one time. <laughs> or twice or three times. But eventually, if you stick with it, you're gonna to come to understand that you do wanna reef those sails early because waiting can make things a lot messier. Same goes for anchoring, not buying enough creamer for your coffee, running out of peanut butter. I think we've got a whole new understanding of risk, a couple types of risk. One is a real risk, but then you've got perceived risks. And these are things that you worry could happen, might be a possibility risk of a meteorite falling on us is it's there it's just a very low risk 
but you build them up more than they actually are and your evaluation of the risk is wrong. A great example is many people fear losing sight of land and they think, oh, that's so scary. I'm just me out there in the ocean. But really being close to land is where you should be more afraid. Absolutely. You could hit something out there mid ocean. It's possible. It doesn't happen very often. But where accidents do happen is when boats run into hard things like land or other boats. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that being further out at sea is safer. Ah, oh, this is a big one. <laughs> I'm the captain. Here's what we're going to do. <laughs> That's not going to work. No. It's not a democracy. When something bad is going down on the boat, there has to be somebody who's in charge and somebody who's directing the operations. That doesn't mean there needs to be a dictator. In fact, on a lot of boats, I would say the couples are more like co-captains. One of the people has assumed the role of captain, but both are responsible for the health and safety of the boat. Yeah, and I think that the bottom line is that each person brings a lot of value to the, the crew and to the journey. And knowing what each person's role is so that they have that ownership and responsibility just saves a lot in communication, or I should say miscommunication. Well, communication, but also just plain time. Yeah. When we first took off, we had read books. The author had said, you know, everybody needs to know how to work on the engine and everybody needs to know how to navigate and everybody needs to know how to change the sails. And some of that is true. Every member of the crew does need to know how to run the boat, navigate, handle the sails, use the throttles. An argument can be made that both he and she need to know how to dock the boat. But do both of us need to know how to change the oil? No. Do both of us need to know how to handle all the paperwork for check-in and check-out? No. <laughs> Do both of us need to know how to cook the best lasagna? No. <laughs> no. It's called divide and conquer. There's a lot of work to do on any cruising boat, and the more you can spread out the responsibility between people, the more that each one of us can focus on what we're good at. You don't want to see me try and sew a sail bag or repair some sailcloth on the boat. Or manage the taxes and insurance and all the other healthcare and budgeting and all that stuff. So I really can appreciate the hard, dirty work that he does. And I think that helps our situation because I can be there for you when you're in the trenches and then he doesn't have to worry about a lot of things. And I know he appreciates that. I absolutely do. So that's one big thing that we've learned over the years is how to work better as a team. And uh, I don't think either one of us could do this alone. Definitely not. <laughs> Ah, oh, okay. Fancy versus no frills when it comes to boats. It's interesting because we've had both, I would say. Um, when we were looking at that Uchimera 55 down in the Bay Area, there was a lot of reaction from folks saying, hey, it doesn't look comfortable. It doesn't look like it's, it's going to have the space that you need and all this sort of thing. Basically, the boat isn't nice enough to cruise on. And I'd say that we have learned there is a lot to be said for a boat you don't mind scratching a little bit here and there. Yeah, I mean, it's great to have creature comforts, and I think you can do that on any size of a boat. But in terms of the outside of the boat, does it need to be perfect? I would say no, because then you're just gonna worry about it all the time and feel like you've gotta constantly polish and clean it. And when you do make that one scratch, you're really gonna be like, oh man, look at <laughs> him, so bummed. See it all the time. People who buy a brand new boat straight out of the factory, they're thinking, listen, I'm going to work less on this boat because it's brand new. Well, you'll work less on, I don't know, maintenance items like the engine or the sail drives, but you will work a lot more on the aesthetics of the boat. You'll be keeping those bilges sparkling clean. It blows me away when somebody says, yeah, this is my first boat and it's 45 feet. A 45 foot boat for your first boat? I mean, that's, that's jumping into the deep end. We did a lot of things wrong. I'd say one thing we did right was start small. For us, we started with a 25 foot Merit and that was the first boat I ever stepped on, put on. I think that getting on a smaller boat at first really teaches a lot more about sailing. We're all out of wind. What will we do without it? <laughs> yeah. The physics, it's all the same in between different sized boats, but the sizes of all the hardware and the sails, the loads, and the potential for 
possible problems. That goes up as you get a bigger boat. We're taking that wisdom into this next purchase. I think the boat that we're looking at right now is something that there's no way we could have handled when we got Clarity six years ago. So learning on Clarity and then moving up in size and speed and value, I think it's a smart move. If you can get to the point where your boat is simple enough to trailer around, all the better. And we have friends that trailer to 47 foot Bavaria across the country. More reasonable though is probably a 30 something foot trimaran, something like that. You know, there's a lot of downwind sailing that's just fantastic and you don't want to turn around and go back upwind. Well, what if you just put it on a trailer and head home? That's a lot easier. Our third boat was a 33 foot Freedom Cat Catch and we put that thing on a truck in San Diego and it arrived in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, it took like two or three days as opposed to two or three months. You know, everybody thinks, oh, just go cruising. I don't have to make any plans. I just go with the flow. And that is not actually true. These things called hurricanes. Well, some people call them typhoons and cyclones, that sort of thing. But tropical storms, as they're broadly known, are a big concern for anybody who's going to be sailing in the tropics. So it's hard to forecast where you're going to be in six months, but as you head out, you really need to have a plan and you need to have, hey, I'm going to be at this marina. They've got space for me. I can always cancel. And this really has to do with your insurance policy. One thing that your insurance company wants to know is where's the boat going to be for storm season? So you got to give them a place and often you got to tell them how the boat's going to be tied up and who might be watching it while you're gone. So yeah, you do have to have some plans for your off season. Yeah, insurance is one of those things that you think, oh, I'll just call the agent, get the insurance, check that box. It's not so simple anymore. I guess it goes back to the idea of starting with a smaller boat and working your way up. You need to tell a story. It's not just gonna be a list of your sea time and on which boats. You need to tell the underwriter a story of sorts about your experience and where you plan to go. Exactly. So crewing on other people's boats, that counts. Any kind of ASA courses, that counts. So be thinking about that ahead of time as you plan. For example, we're planning to go around the world and my insurance broker is like, okay, so what's your, have you crossed any oceans? Like, no, we haven't. And so we have to tell the entire story of our 20 years in order to make the underwriter comfortable with us crossing an ocean. It seemed like a big gamble at the time as we told our coworkers, hey, we're headed off sailing in our 20s. And then we met so many older people who would tell us, oh, you're so smart to go young. Things only get harder. You lose some of your courage as you get older. Yep, and I would say with that, you can always begin again. And so even if you get one boat and you think, oh, this isn't the right boat, sell it, get a different one. One of the most highlighted passages in, uh, in my book, Live on the Margin, is you can always make more money, you can never make more time. And that's something that we have definitely found to be true. Yes, you're giving up a secure income source to head off and go cruising. You were in high tech, I was in television. And never could we have figured out that this would be our financial future, making home videos. <laughs> and playing them on the internet. <laughs> and bringing cruising life to you. I'd say the longer we've been at this, the, the more we've said to ourselves, we don't need so much crap in our lives. Let's get rid of this, let's get rid of that. In other words, valuing experiences over stuff. Okay, we do have a small storage unit that's about a five by 10 of all really personal precious items. But even, precious. That, even that, there's a lot in there we could get rid of. Not everybody has to have a YouTube channel, but everybody No, everybody has to have a YouTube channel. It's the new law. Everybody has a phone. It looks like we're documenting every moment of our lives. And I guess we are these days, but there was a time when we didn't. There are huge holes in our hard drive space-time continuum where we just don't have anything. We don't have video. We don't even have any still fun. It's a little sad. I think that I've learned over the last 20 years just document everything. Mm -hmm. This YouTube deal, this is very new for the O'Kellys. It's been three years and two months or three years and three months, but we've actually been out having adventures since 2002. And I wish that we had as much captured from those early days as we do from the more recent adventures. 100%. 
Sailing around means checking in and out of countries all the time. That means dealing with officials, bureaucrats, if you will. Now, by and large, the people we've dealt with in the officialdom world have been very, very nice, accommodating people who've tolerated our mistakes on their paperwork situations. But that hasn't always been the case. I was taught one time, you know what? You need to be more patient. We were at the BVI's. I had accidentally gotten to the end of my visa without renewing. And you know what? I got frustrated. They weren't having it. <laughs> they said, you got to go. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a really good lesson to be patient with everything in life. Don't <laughs> argue with reality. Well, from Goonies land, we're going to call this one good and, and head back for more coffee. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. Thanks, as always, to the patrons for helping to support these videos. We're going to have big news here the next week or two regarding, well, I don't even want to say the name. I'm superstitious now. But big news coming your way about our next boat. Thanks, everyone. Bye. What's your favorite part of this trip? I like... There's a lot of parts to this trip. But I like them all equally. There was a couple... Okay, okay, I know there one day. There had to be day. a couple high points, a okay. couple low points. One day was anchored out in Monterey the day before we left. And it was just the daytime. Sunny. It was actually followed by the worst night of the trip. <laughs> and then the worst sail of the trip followed by the best night in Santa Cruz when we arrived at 5 p.m. on a Wednesday night and watched all the sailors go out for their races. We arrived just in time. Oh, just in time. Got the best slip in the whole marina where we could see the lighthouse. So there you go. There's a sandwich for you. So the good, the bad, and the ugly were all within the, the Two days. highest Two days. point of this trip was probably crossing from Monterey to Santa Cruz. And why was it so bad? We were close hauled. No, that was a high point. Oh. That was the best that point. That was the best point? That, that was, was when awesome. I was miserable? You were miserable, but the sailing was fantastic. We yeah. were about as close hauled as we could get. We had just the staysail and a full main. And we were doing like eight knots upwind. And there was waves crashing over the bow. Everything was getting wet. But should, we were flying. I should have taken my bony. You should have taken your bony. But it was all psychological. We know that now. No, we don't. It didn't even matter about the bony. I think it's not psychological. You are not prone to seasickness, woman. I know this about you. I've seen seasickness. You are not seasick. I've got, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, it's really mild out. But then I go, well, maybe it's really cold because I have two pairs of long johns, my foul weather gear, wool socks, boots that go up to my knees, three long sleeve shirts, a fleece, a fleece vest, <laughs> and this red jacket and a hat. That does it, huh? <laughs> and I'm not cold. No, not anymore. Motor I almost sail, feel like I can be with Motor sail, motor sail, motor sail, we just...